Well, hello everyone, I'm David Ergen, and I want to welcome all of you to this third in a series of webinars sponsored by ASSOCT. Today we have Professor Chris Witten from the University of Melbourne, who will share his experiences with standing CT for distal limb imaging of racehorses. Chris is an equine surgeon and the head of the Equine Center at the University of Melbourne and leads the Equine Limb Injury Prevention Program which is dedicated to developing training and management protocols for racehorses. I can say straight away that Chris has an outstanding clinical and research team supporting his efforts. Our moderator today is Dr. Peter Muir from the University of Wisconsin. Peter is a professor of surgical sciences at the UW and the head of the orthopedic research lab. I've had the pleasure of working with Peter over the last couple of years on the use of standing CT to evaluate stress fractures in horses. So at this point, I will turn the presentation over to Peter, who will kick off today's webinar. All right, um, thank you, David, for that uh, introduction. Welcome everybody to the webinar. I'm very excited to moderate this presentation, which has some great information on standing CT, particularly with application to racehorses. So next slide, please. Regarding um, conflict of interest disclosure, I need to disclose to everyone that I'm a co-founder of ASTOCT in addition to my academic appointment and that Chris Witten has uh, no um, disclosures. So next slide. So to introduce everybody um, and this, that, uh, to the community for this um, presentation, as you can see from these uh, pie charts, um, we have had fantastic engagement with this seminar from a diverse community interested in racehorses. Um, since I made this uh, graph or these graphs the other day, um, registrations for this meeting are now up to 336 participants. So we're extremely grateful for everybody's interest in this um, work. We have participants from all over the world, which is really great. And we also have participants with a wide variety of backgrounds, including university faculty, staff and students, racing administrators, equine practitioners, and owners. So I'm looking forward to an excellent discussion of CT imaging in racehorses. Next slide, please. So uh, for the agenda during this presentation, Professor Witten will discuss early detection of bone injury, standing CT, post-mortem CT studies and case, some case examples. During the presentation, please use the question and answer tab at the bottom of the webinar screen to ask a question. We'll answer questions at the end of each section of the talk, as well as a wrap-up discussion at the end of the presentation. Um, it's now my pleasure to hand over to Professor Witten to give his presentation on limb CT and racehorses. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks, Peter, and thank you, David, for um, inviting me to speak on this topic. <clears throat> so I hope that everyone's staying safe. Um, we know these are challenging times, and certainly for us, research funding has become a challenge. Um, but racing's still going in Australia, and horses are still putting their lives on the line. I was in the post-mortem room only yesterday, um, and every time I'm in there, it makes me more and more determined to try and make a difference in this area. So as uh, Peter said, I have no relationship with uh, ASTO-CT except that we have purchased the system from them. Um, the funding sources to purchase the system were through our research program, which is funded by Racing Victoria, the Victorian State Government and the University of Melbourne. I want to acknowledge the University of Melbourne clinicians, Liz Wormsley, Kate Steele and Jenny Raffetto, who gave me access to some of the case material that I'm presenting today. Uh, and I need to thank Peter Hitchens, who helped me with the data analysis that I'm going to talk about, and Katrina Garrett, who helped me with the data collection. Uh, and we had ethics approval for all the stuff I'm showing today. So our research program is a multidisciplinary program. We uh, have developed a computational model of the forelimb of the horse from which we get the loads and the tendons and the joints of a galloping horse. We then apply those loads repeatedly under cyclical loading as we're doing here uh, to samples of bone in the lab to try and understand how bone behaves when it's loaded 
the way it is in a galloping horse. We quantify micro damage in the subchondral bone. Um, we've done that in the distal metacarpus and we're starting to do that in the sesamoid bones, as I'll talk about a little bit later. We're really interested in how bone adapts to training. So an inexperienced horse's subchondral bone on the left, an experienced racehorse in the middle here, and then D adapts when the horse is arrested for training. And that's a horse that's been resting for nine weeks on the right there. Uh, and you get this bone resorption in the immediate subchondral bone and increased bone turnover. We're also really interested in how bone repairs through turnover. And we're studying that in detail. And then we've done a lot of big data analysis trying to understand risk factors for injury. And that's driven by my colleague, Peter Hitchens. And so where does 3D imaging fit into this? We need 3D imaging for our biomechanical studies so we can do subject specific models of horses to understand loading in the bone. And we also need it to do longitudinal studies of how bone adapts to training and racing. And then finally, it's really important for early detection as we're gonna talk about today. So I'm just gonna start off with uh, a case just to whet your appetite. We'll go back to more cases later on. Uh, but this is a case with a four-year-old thoroughbred racehorse that performed well during its first preparation as a three-year-old. But then first up in its four-year-old preparation, it's performed poorly. It's had a right hind limb lameness of six weeks duration, which it warms out of, making it quite difficult for the vets at the track to block it and to work out what was going on. So they ended up radiographing the whole limb. Uh, they were able to identify some modeling on the lateral aspect of the tarsus, uh, but they weren't sure of the significance of that. Uh, the distal hock joints were medicated and the fetlock with no effect. So it was eventually referred to us for scintigraphy because they couldn't localize the source of the lameness. Here's the scintigraphic images. Here's a rear view of the left and right hind limbs. And you can see we've got this focal hot spot on the lateral aspect of the hock and the right hind. Here's a lateral view of the left hind, which is relatively normal. And then a lateral view of the right hind. And again, we've got this focal hot spot on the lateral aspect of the tarsus. So normally we would um, consider this a sign of collateral ligament uh, insertional injury because uh, we have our short collateral ligament attaching there um, on the lateral aspect. But because we had the CT, we were interested in seeing whether there was more going on. So here's a transverse view on the left of the tarsus, our talus here and our calcaneus here. And you can see the new bone that was um, evident on the x-rays and, uh, and, and corresponding to where the hotspot is on the scintigraphy on the lateral aspect here. But deeper in, in the talocalcanean um, articulation, we've got this very deep subchondral bone lysis and surrounding sclerosis. And as we go through that, you can see how deep it is into the subchondral bone. And this is a relatively significant lesion. We can see it here also on the sagittal view, deep into the subchondral bone, sclerosis surrounding it. If we go to the dorsal view, we've got the new bone on the lateral aspect here. And then we can see this quite complex, what almost looks like a subchondral bone fracture running across the subchondral bone surrounded by sclerosis. Shows up nicely on the 3D view, uh, the uh, new bone production. And interestingly, notice how separated this is from the joint. And if this was all you saw as on the x-rays, it would be very easy to think this was the only thing going on and you wouldn't even be suspicious that there might be something going on in the joint. Um, but with a CT, we're able to see uh, that deep in the joint, there's um, a quite significant lesion going on. So this is really important for prognosis for the horse and uh, how we're going to manage it. Um, also notice how high we can get with the CT. We've easily got all the tarsus in in this horse and particularly useful CT for complex joints like the tarsus and the carpus, as I'll show you a little bit later. So coming back to our research program and to put some background behind it. So for those of you who don't know um, about Australian racing, the Melbourne Cup is Australia's highest profile race. It's watched by lots of non-racing people. Um, so it's, a, it's the biggest race of the season of, of the year for us. And it's in the last eight years, there's been a number of fatalities which have um, been a real problem and been one of the impetuses for our research program. When we think about 
catastrophic injuries, we need to think about what's, why, they're, why they're happening and why they're different from non-catastrophic injuries. So our non-fatal injuries, the lameness or the clinical signs prompt investigation. So the horse goes lame, everybody wants to know why, you do an investigation and you deal with the problem. Our fatal injuries are a little different in that the lameness of the clinical signs are not severe enough to prompt investigation. So they might be there, but they might, but they might be explained away as being less important or just the same as what a normal horse might be experience, experiencing, or they might be completely absent. Alternatively, they develop too rapidly. So things come on so rapidly, like they might come on within a race and we don't actually notice them until it's too late. So this is where imaging might help us in trying to identify horses that are not showing um, much in the way of clinical signs or their clinical signs are relatively mild. We know that um, for most um, fatigue injuries that we see, the catastrophic injuries that we see going through the postmortem room, we know that a lot of them have pre-existing pathology. So here's a typical condylar fracture in a racehorse. Um, and here you can see this defect in the subchondral bone. If we look at that closely, that's got this honeycomb appearance. So this resorption has been going on for some time, at least weeks. Uh, and that's a window of opportunity to be identified with imaging. If we look at that uh, and we know we can pick it up with CT. So here's a CT post-mortem of a horse with a condylar fracture. And we've got this focal area of resorption and this surrounding area of sclerosis um, that we can pick up with, C with CT. If we look at that with higher power, so here on electron microscopy, we've got our fracture running up through here and note the large voids in the bone surrounding it where the uh, cells, the osteoclasts have come in and removed the bone, but also this darker bone we see, which is bone that's been turned over relatively recently. New bone has less minerals, so is less dense than the normal bone sitting out here. And so this combination of lower density bone and voids give us this appearance on CT of reduced de focal reduced density. And that's a relatively common finding for us associated with condylar fractures in particular. So if we're after an imaging technique that's going to identify um, pre-existing pathology, we want something with relatively high resolution because sometimes these areas are quite small we need to be able to clearly image the areas where, from where the fractures propagate from. And because a majority of our fractures are coming from the fetlock region, that's an important area to um, be able to image. It needs to be efficient if we're going to be able to um, image lots of horses um, and remembering that because uh, fatal injuries are relatively low in incidence, you're gonna have to image a lot of horses to find one that is um, at high risk. It needs to, and it also needs to provide minimal disruption to the training po program and be cost effective. Otherwise trainers are not gonna um, let their horses be imaged. So this is why we've gone down the standing CT path. Um, it fulfills a number of those requirements for us. It is very quick as I'll, uh, I'll talk about. We, we can, it only takes 30 seconds to actually do the image. The longest time is getting the horses prepared and positioned. Um, there's no disruption of training. We can have the horse in and out um, relatively quickly. And so it doesn't disrupt their training. It's the highest resolution currently available for standing um, imaging in the horse. Uh, clearly we can only do the distal limb, but we can get up to carpus and hock as I just showed you. Um, at the moment, we don't have enough data to know how sensitive and specific it is for detecting fractures, but that's something we're working on. Uh, to try and understand and I'll show you some data that we've already got um, and it's important to understand that it's struck it's de um, detecting structure only it's not detecting bone turnover um, which is things like scintigraphy and PET scanning are able to do and sorry that we can do it clearly we can do front front we're doing front legs there in a horse and then turning around and doing the hind legs and when we image, we image both legs at once. So it's really very efficient. You get all the um, image with one pass of the machine, you get both legs in one go. Uh, you turn the horse around and do the um, other, other end of the horse. So we'll stop there for a second and see if we have any questions um, so far. Uh, yes, so please um, uh, 
turn in your questions using the Q&A button at the end of the screen. Um, we have a few minutes for questions before the next section of the talk. So Chris, Chris, perhaps I could just start with um, asking you, can you give an indication of how long it takes to image a horse, for example, or for fetlocks? So we had, um, when we had horses prior to the Melbourne Cup last year come in, we did three horses, four and hind fetlocks. Uh, they came in on the truck an hour and a half later, they were back on the truck on their way back to their stable. So about half an hour per horse. And that was relatively, relatively early in our use of the system and relatively in it, we were relatively inexperienced. So I think you could certainly do it a little bit quicker than that. So it's around about half an hour is a com very comfortable amount of time to scan a, a single horse or four fetlocks. And we have some nice questions coming in. So another one would be how noisy is the machine during acquisition? Image um, acquisition. It, yeah, it's relatively quiet. Um, we do put cotton wool in the horse's ears um, and we do try to get them used to the noise first before we raise the system right up. So, um, but once, once you do that, that, we've not had a horse react to the noise at all. Okay, and um, another question is, uh, what sort of dose are your handlers receiving whilst they're in the room with the patient being scanned? So um, I'm not very good on the actual dose, but we've, um, being a university, we have very strict radiation control requirements and we, uh, they were very concerned about it when we were putting it in because as you know, CT in general has a very high radiation output. Um, and so when we put the system in, they were all over us trying to test. Um, they very quickly lost interest um, because they discovered that the radiation levels were very low and we haven't seen them since um, because they're very comfortable. Um, we monitor all our staff and we've had no issues whatsoever. Uh, okay, we have, um, I think, time for one more question in this section. So there's an interesting question just been submitted. Um, what type of horses were selected for the procedure? Were they radiographed um, previously? I know that I think you're gonna sort of expand on that later in the talk. Sorry, for which specific procedure are we talking about? For, so for CT. We, we, so how, how were okay. horses um, chosen or selected for CT imaging? So we're a referral center. So just whatever, anything that we think requires it at the moment. So some of them have had x-rays, some of them have had scintigraphy. Um, it just depends on which they come through all different um, diagnostic routes to end up in, in CT. There's no specific requirement. Um, and one of the interesting things is that because it's so quick and easy, my staff actually have been saying to me, you know, can we avoid x-raying these horses because it's so much quicker and easier to do CT on them? Um, and I have to sort of dampen that um, enthusiasm for the system down because, you know, we need to go, go the right, um, go, go via the right paths. Okay. Um, uh, please keep sending your questions in. Um, we're not, we'll keep, um, uh, working on those as we move through the talk, but I think it's time for the next section of the presentation. So I think that we'll move on to early detection of bone injury now. Okay, so um, when we decided that we needed this for our research program and our clinical work, we set, were set a very um, short time frame to get it in prior to last year's um, Spring Carnival and Melbourne Cup. And um, I actually didn't think that would be possible knowing how universities work and uh, how difficult it is to get any building work done. I was not concerned about the company's ability to, to, to deliver, um, but we got everyone focused and um, we did manage to get it in in time. Um, I was very impressed with both um, our builders and the um, company who are a relatively young company and were working on the other side of the world for only their third install and everything went really smoothly and we did manage to get it in in time um, for the Melbourne Cup. We So it was installed in October. We imaged five horses, both front and hind fetlocks prior to the Melbourne Cup, three of which were eventually scratched and two were allowed to run. Um, and clearly that caused quite a lot of controversy, controversy about uh, the system and what we were doing. There was a perception that, uh, and 
there was a perception that it was because it was a new, a relatively new technology that we really didn't have the experience to be able to make the decisions that we were making. Um, but what people didn't understand is that we'd had CT at the University of Melbourne since 2005, and we'd been doing adult, ho adult horses um, under general anaesthetic with CT since 2012, and we've got a large database of post-mortem material, which I'm going to talk about a bit later. Um, so we felt that we had at least some handle on what we were doing and were able to make um, some calls on, on what, whether these horses were safe to run or not. Um, and so um, it informed an important part of um, trying to reduce the risk. Um, we were lucky we had no injuries, um, no uh, severe injuries in the Melbourne Cup. We did have one pelvic injury uh, that has since recovered quite well, um, but we didn't have any lower limb injuries. Uh, thank goodness uh, that may be luck rather than good management, but um, it's important that we keep trying hard to lower the injury rate. Uh, it's important to understand that our current pre-race usage is only in horses that have clinical indications, so lameness, heat or effusion. You could argue that catastrophic injuries occur in horses that don't have those uh, things, but we do know that when you've got, um, when veterinarians have been uh, alarmed by something in the horse's leg or concerned by something in the horse's leg, that those horses are at higher risk. So, so we thought we'd start with the highest risk horses first and develop our experience with those before we moved on to um, imaging wider and hopefully having more data to be able to do that um, in horses without clinical signs. We are only doing the fetlocks. We're not going up and doing the hocks and carpuses for these horses, mainly for um, speed and because it's rare to get catastrophic injuries associated with the tarsus and the carpus, although you can very occasionally. Um, and it was n not the only reason for withdrawing a horse. So it was just more data that was added to the um, information that the regulatory vets already had before they made a decision to withdraw the horse. It was never done purely on the um, CT alone. So when we're imaging horses, it's important to understand that we can't see micro damage. Um, I'm not aware and I might be proved wrong with the newer techniques coming along like PET and things like that, but I'm not aware of anything so far that's been proven to show micro damage in horses. So what we're looking for is the secondary changes associated with that. So here's a crack on an electron microscopy image in a um, parasagittal groove of a racehorse. Um, we're not going to see this crack, a crack of this size on the CT, but what we do see is what I showed you before, the surrounding resorption and less dense bone creating a, an area of lysis. So this sort of thing here, um, and then the surrounding sclerosis around that. So the secondary changes are what we're looking for, not the primary changes. Same thing in sesamoid bones. Sue Stove has shown really nicely that you get the similar type of lesions in sesamoid bones that are associated with fracture, focal resorption in the subchondral bone, so just under the cartilage in a sesamoid bone. And we see those as well, although they're not as common as um, in the uh, third metacarpal bone. So here's an indentation in a sesamoid bone, an area of lysis surrounded by sclerosis. We can see it here area of uh, lysis indentation in the surface, uh, very sclerotic sesamoid bone. And so these are the sort of things we're looking for, the secondary changes associated with the micro damage. And the question then becomes for risk assessment with imaging, can we determine the level of risk? And we're probably not able to determine the absolute level of risk at the moment, but we can determine the relative risk uh, to some degree. And then the other question you need to ask yourself is what level of risk is tolerable because of course we can't eliminate risk completely ever. And so it's important to um, work out what level of risk is tolerable and then decide at what, what's our threshold of, of risk that we're going to allow a horse to run or, or not to run. And these, are, these questions were questions that were asked and we tried to answer a recent meeting in Newmarket where we got a number of experts together to try and nut this out and a consensus statement is going to come out um, very shortly on that in the Equine Veterinary Journal. Um, and when you read that, you'll see that it's very difficult to uh, determine risk and that we need a lot more research. And so certainly that's something that we're working on and working towards as we go forward. So we'll have another stop for some more questions. 
Okay, more, more questions have come in. Um, so one question would, uh, that's sort of emerging several questions here in Chris is, could you comment on, you comment a little bit on image resolution already, but could you comment on sort of uh, how you handle motion during imaging and the type of sedation that you've, you use for your horses? So we're just sedating, we're giving them a, a little bit of um, ACP to start with, and then we sedate them with detomidine just before the scan. Um, we did try using some uh, opioids to start with, but they do tend to move more with that, we found. Um, so we've stopped using that. Um, motion, the, mo mo motion does degrade the image the area of the image that is being scanned at the time. So as you're going down the leg, if the horse moves, um, you might lose a bit of the image at that point, but then when it stands still again, as you keep going down, you get the rest of the image fine. Um, so we just repeat it. Um, and sometimes if the horse is moving a lot, it's, we then use a combination of the images we've t obtained to um, get a complete, um, Im a complete set of images without motion. Um, it's rare for us to have to repeat more than three times um, because most of our horses have been able to be sedated. It's so quick and um, that they only have to stand still for a very short period of time. So uh, yes, motion can be an issue, but mostly we manage it just by repeat scans. And we've only, as I say, th three scans generally does most horses pretty well. Um, another question that's uh, come in is, have you, uh, for the fetlock work that you've been doing, have you uh, made any efforts to sort of compare CT findings with flex DP um, uh, emit radiographs of the fetlock? We haven't done that in any detail yet, um, but a number of the horses that I'll show you have had um, flex DPs and were unable to identify some of the lesions that we've seen. And then um, another question is, Chris, for the first case example that you showed or the other cases, could you just confirm that these images that you're showing in the talk were generate, were made by the ASTO CT scanner? The clinical images I'm showing were, yes. Um, I did the one I yeah. showed, the only one that's not, the only image I've shown so far that's not was that um, sesamoid lesion that I showed, but I'll show you another sesamoid lesion later on that's taken with the standing CT. Excellent. And could you comment on the um, correlation that you've observed so far between uh, scintigraphic findings and CT findings? Um, we've only had the system since October <clears throat> and We've probably we've probably done about five or six horses that have had both, so it's hard to give you a a specific answer on that. Um, but that one I've just showed you is an example of a focal area of uptake that we saw um, a reasonable amount of pathology on CT, and I'll show you another one later on where we've got the CT and the scintigraphy where um, they cor cor correlate quite nicely. So. I think we're of the, we need to do a lot more clearly to be able to answer that question in any detail, but the few numbers we've done so far, um, we've generally found something when we've seen a hotspot and we've then gone and scanned it with CT. But as we know, scintigraphy can show you up a lot of things that may or may not be necessarily be a significant problem. Okay, and I think we have um, time still for a couple more questions. So for the Fetlock CT scans, could you comment on, um, whether you have a preferred um, way that you like to reconstruct the images. Um, so are there's a particular plane that you find useful to uh, assess fat locks for um, fatigue injury? Yes, yeah, so I'll show that in, in a minute. We, one, um, the important um, plane for us is the oblique dorsal plane, which I'll show you um, when, I, when we do some of the fetlock scans um, because that then slices perpendicularly through the area where POD and condylar fractures that Palmer aspect where they arise from so I think that's an important um, image plane to take and we always include that along with our standard three other planes. Excellent and could you comment on um, your experience with limitations with horse size regarding the CT system? Um, <clears throat> Well, we've, we have done a miniature in it, um, and 
So, uh, which was a little bit challenging because clearly you, to get the clearance for the machine to come up under their belly is difficult. Um, and we've done a draft horse in it. So yeah, I, I don't think there's any limitations to size. Excellent. Um, in, um, there's another question that uh, I was really asking about the sort of getting at the topic of screening, potentially screening for racehorses. So in, in, um, can, you, can you comment on the idea that when you consider horses that have suffered catastrophic injuries or, or fractures, in your opinion, what percentage of these horses would be lame, say, in the last seven days before the fatal injury occurred? Um, I think that's one of the issues is that they're not one of the reasons why we get these catastrophic injuries is that they're often not particularly lame, but they may have subtle signs. And the problem is that a lot of horses have subtle signs. And so trying to differentiate them from the general population is really difficult, but it's not uncommon to find that the horse has been doing something slightly wrong, but it's often relatively mild. Um, so I think it's difficult, but um, we do know that horses with, issues that have been identified by veterinarians are at higher risk of injury. So um, that's why we've tended to focus on the, those to start with. Um, but, you know, as time goes by and we get more understanding of the system, we're hoping to broaden that um, because clearly there's horses that are um, having catastrophic injuries that are showing very little in the way of signs. Excellent. Um, I think uh, to stay on time, we need to move on to the next section on um, post-mortem CT studies, but please keep sending in your uh, questions uh, as we go along. Okay, so to try and um, be able to better utilize the information we're getting from CT, we've done a, a, a bit of work looking at our post-mortem samples. Uh, and this is a paper we published a little while back using high resolution CT um, of third metacarpal bones to try and see if there was any, um, try to understand its ability to predict fracture. Um, and we showed that sclerosis, so increased bone volume in the distal um, metacarpus was associated with fracture. So the more, the more bone volume fraction we had, the more likely you were to have fracture. And as a measure of the extent of the sclerosis, we measured how far it extended up the leg um, for, at the parasagittal groove and all those horses that had more than 6.5 millimeters um, extending of uh, sclerosis had a fracture, but we had a number of horses that had less than that that also had a fracture. So um, quite specific, but not particularly sensitive. Um, and, uh, but something to keep in mind and it's certainly something that we look for when we're uh, looking at CT scans. Um, we also looked at parasagittal fissures. Uh, now, clearly, you can't look at those in the fractured limb because it's already fractured. Um, but in the, we, our interest was whether these were something that are common and so therefore not that useful to predict fracture or whether they were rare. And we didn't see any in our controls, admittedly very low numbers. Um, and we saw them in a number of our um, fractured cases in the contralateral limb. And here's two examples. Um, and as I'll talk about a little bit later, I, I've started to think that fishes are not the right word to talk about. Uh, I'm more interested in the lysis that sits below them that we're seeing here. We've got a little fissure here. And again, we've got this sort of surface fissure here and we've got the lysis that sits below it. Um, and these are both in contralateral limbs from a horse that, that's fractured. Notice that this horse has got it in both parasagittal grooves and this horse had a biaxial fracture in its um, other leg. We've gone on to do a larger study and this is uh, something we're working on at the moment. And this is, so this is pre preliminary data, but this is what has shaped um, how we're interpreting our scans at the moment. Um, so we're up to 94 horses that we've scanned at least the left fore in or both front legs if the right fore is fractured. Um, the majority of them are local horses, but we have some internationals. Again, the majority are flat races. We did have 16 jumps horses in amongst this, um, and I'll show you the data both with and without the jumps horses for those jurisdictions that only do flat racing. We had 57 fractures and 37 without a fracture. So it's a reasonable number of controls, although we'd like a lot more. Um, 
and the majority of the fractures were condylar fractures and the majority of those were forelimb fractures, but we did have a number of sesamoid fractures as well, which were all in the forelimb. So when we looked at this parasagittal lysis that we're seeing on a um, CT scan, we no noticed that, you know, and again, the question is how common is, is this in horses that are not at risk of fracture? And we saw it in 5% of our horses without a fracture. And yet in our, our condylar fracture group, we see it in over 60% of our horses. And that's probably a little bit of an underestimate because some of the more catastrophic injuries, we lose bone and you may not actually find the lysis because the bone, bone is so badly damaged. So much more common in fractured horses than non-fractured horses. We've gone on and done multiple logistic regression to try and understand uh, how these various findings on CT um, contribute to fracture. Uh, we account for age because the older the horse is, the more likely it is to have lesions. Um, and what we've found with all that, with, when we look at all the horses is that para, horses, horses with this parasagal lysis um, of any size, whether it, um, we tried to put it in under, uh, we measured the area of it as well and tried to put that into the um, regression analysis and it didn't work very well. Um, worked much better if it was just presence or absence of lysis. But you can see there, there are about seven times the odds of having a fracture if you've got parasagittal lysis. When we measured the parasagittal subchondral bone thickness for every millimeter increase in thickness, we have a 30% increase in the odds of having a fracture. But when we identified palmar osteochondral disease, so that's these subchondral bone lesions we see in the condyle of horses relatively commonly, we see that if you've got one of those, either mild or more severe, you are less likely to have a fracture. If we look at the flat racing horses only, we take out the jumps horses, the data is almost identical, but our parasagittal lysis becomes slightly more important. We're up to nine times the odds now of having a fracture. And again, you're less likely to have a fracture if you've got palmar osteochondral disease. So because you're less likely to have a fracture with palmar osteochondral disease, we were interested in whether this, having this cancelled out parasagittal lysis and, and or sclerosis in particular, because often we see the two together. Um, and so we did an analysis just in the flat racing horses only this time I'm showing the data for, and we've combined the findings. So if you've got lysis without POD, you're still around the, nine, the eight times the odds of having a fracture. But if you have both lysis and a POD of any grade, it doesn't cancel that out completely. The odds ratio comes down slightly, but it's still significant and we still have an increased risk of fracture. So having a POD does not um, completely remove the risk. Uh, what it does do is reduce the um, odds ratio and the significance associated with the thickness. And that's probably because, as I'll show you in a minute, the POD is explaining some of that increased risk, in, increased thickness um, in that area. So parasagittal lysis, as I said, the size of the area doesn't seem to matter. Um, it's more whether it's there or it's not. And I would argue that that's probably the size is probably more a sign of chronicity. Um, and you could have a small area of lysis that's rapidly growing that is, prob that is more dangerous than a large area of lysis that is static. Um, so size doesn't seem to matter so much. Um, and it's much more, the lysis is much more important if, if it's associated with this sclerosis that we see um, surrounding the, the area. And notice how with a fracture as we have here, the sclerosis tends to lean towards that. Whereas when we have a POD like we have here, subchondral bone injury, it tends to be more centered over the POD and not so much in the parasagittal groove like we see here. So when we see that sclerosis extending into the parasagittal groove, we get more concerned. POD explains some of the increase in that parasagittal groove thickness. So here's an example on a high resolution micro CT of a um, POD lesion here, and you can see a large amount of sclerosis associating with it, and that's spreading over into the parasagittal groove and increasing the thickness there. But this horse is not at risk of fracture because there's no evidence of any lysis in that area. Um, so it explains some of that increase in thickness, but because it does, if you've got the two together, it doesn't negate um, the presence of parasagittal lysis. So the two together is still a risk for, for fracture. 
So we looked at sesamoids and we looked at both sclerosis and lysis in those. Um, but the only thing that turned out to be significantly associated with fracture was the most sclerotic um, grade of uh, sesamoid bone. So we've just graded it subjectively. Um, I'm trying to think of a work out a way of doing that more objectively and I'd be happy for anyone to offer any suggestions on that. Um, but again, we're around the nine times the risk of uh, having a sesamoid fracture if you have a, a, um, the highest grade of um, sclerosis associated with it. Uh, if we go to flat horses only, that drops slightly, but it's still significant. Sorry. Um, and we know that um, sclerosis is associated with fracture. Work out of um, Cornell has shown that the most um, that, that the horses with sesamoid fractures have the most sclerotic um, sesamoid bones. And here's micro CT images of sesamoid bones, a longitudinal section and a transverse section here. And here's one that's very sclerotic, really dense. We've lost most of our spaces as, as opposed to this one, which is probably one of the least dense sesamoids we've scanned so far with micro CT. Um, we've, also, we've also shown, and we're trying to get, uh, we're about to submit a paper on this uh, in the near future, that, mic that sclerosis of um, sesamoid bones is associated with micro damage. So this is the area of bone where Sue Stover describes these um, subchondral bone lesions occurring. And here you can see how micro damage shows up on a micro CT, these hypermineralized cracks running across the surface. Um, and when we quantify those, we see they're associated with sclerosis. So sclerosis is associated with both micro damage and fracture. Um, so it is of concern when we see these highly sclerotic um, sesamoid bones. Um, we didn't get an association with um, lysis within the sesamoid bones. And that's probably because it was a relatively rare occurrence for us. Um, in the sesamoid bones. We've actually scanned a lot of sesamoid bones now with micro CT and so looking in great detail and we do see it, but it is not that common, not nearly as common as, as it is in third metacarpal bones. Having said that, here is an example of a horse uh, that died with a um, biaxial sesamoid fracture that has a really large area of lysis that we can see. This, is, this image is taken with the standing CT system, but in a post-mortem sample. And you can see the lysis here, you can see it here. This is a quite an extensive area of lysis in this horse. And we've had a fracture associated with that exactly as Sue Stover describes. So summary of our CT po post-mortem findings. Um, parasagittal lysis and increased subchondral bone thickness increases the odds of a condylar fracture. Palmer osteochondral disease lessens the odds of a fracture, but doesn't negate parasagittal lysis if it's there. And highly sclerotic sesamoid bones increases the odds of sesamoid fracture. And here's just an example here again in a live horse standing CT. Uh, here we've got this sclerosis surrounding focal lysis in the parasagittal groove. Uh, and notice how the sclerosis is coming across into the parasagittal area. Same on this side, it's a little bit more focal, the lysis here, but we would certainly be concerned when we saw that. Uh, and this is the contralateral limb on a horse that has a fracture in its other limb. So uh, fractured in the other limb, contralateral limb has what we see here. And if you look closely again at this one, we've got focal lysis here at the side of the fracture, and we've got this uh, sclerosis extending up the fracture line. So they're the, the things that we're looking for on the CT um, that are of concern to us. So do we have any questions on that? Oh yes, more questions are coming in. So uh, one, one important question I think, Chris, is would you please comment on the, your thoughts about artificial intelligence software in the, with the idea that um, as the field moves forward, if larger numbers of horses receive CT imaging, how, mu how, how great a need or what's your view of, of uh, the challenge over analyzing all of these image sets from these horses and, and how do you see AI software fitting into that? Uh, it's certainly something we've considered um, and something that we probably will be doing moving forward. I think it might, might well have a place, but you know, like all these things, it has to be investigated. Um, and then uh, some more questions coming in about sesamoid, um, your sesamoid uh, work. Um, do Hounsfield unit values correlate with the micro damage findings? Have you looked at that at all? 
Uh, no, we haven't, but we do know that, as I say, the um, bone volume fraction as measured with the micro CT does, um, whereas the bone mineral density that we measure with micro CT doesn't seem to have as good a correlation with it. So um, bone volume fraction appears to be the more sensitive measure. So how that may well then transfer to Hounsfield units because they're a combination of both your bone mineral density and your bone volume fraction, but that would be something we'd have to look at. In another question coming in, were you able to collect or have you looked at any training data on the horses in your PM study to try and understand connections between athletic activity and some of the uh, bone findings you've made? Uh, we haven't in that study, but um, that is certainly, we have, we don't have training data for those horses. We have racing data. Um, and that's certainly something that we're constantly looking at, but it is a challenge. It's because it's, you know, the, the, the thing, the thing that we've probably, one of the big things we've learned in the last few years is that there are multiple pathways to fracture. Um, so you can get fractures in horses and injuries in horses that are doing very little and you can get fractures and injuries in horses that are doing a lot and they're completely different pathways to the same endpoint. And so looking at that, it's always difficult to div divide those things out, but they are things that we're constantly looking at. Um, and we would love to get better, um, training data. It's not that easy to do here, um, in Australia, but that would in our ideal world, we'd have all the training data and all the racing data for all these horses. And that would make a huge difference to us trying to understand what's going on. Right. I think we have time for one more question um, in this section. So there's a question about the um, subchondral fissures that you describe um, mm -hmm. where um, uh, participants that are commenting on, on, on their experience that they're not necessarily convinced that these are indeed true fractures and some of them, have been followed over time and seem benign in the sound horse. So could you comment on um, your knowledge or experience with following some of the horses with these fishes over time and what your observations have been? So that's, that's why we have divided, that's, that's why I'm very, want to be very clear about the difference between what's a fissure, so an indentation in the articular surface and what is lysis. Um, I think they're different things and I totally agree that we, in the post-mortem room we see fissures in the surface all the time. I think they're relatively common and I don't get excited about them. That's why we, you need that combination of the sclerosis and the lysis. But having said that, I'm sure there are plenty of horses that have that finding that um, don't go on to fracture. Um, remembering that sclerosis and lysis is the healing process and sometimes it wins and works but sometimes it doesn't and so yeah we need a lot more data to know um, how important they are but having said that in our survey of the normal horses they're much less common than they are in the horses with fracture um, but I totally agree they could well be that they could well be out there and be going along fine that's why we've got the ct so that we can monitor horses longitudinally all our data so far has been cross-sectional and that clearly has its limitations and that's why we're doing it with um wanting to do it more longitudinally to try and understand how often you see those things and they don't become a fracture but all i can say is that in our population um there there's only about five percent of horses that have focal lysis in the in the parasagittal groove and i as i say that i i define that differently to a fissure um and i don't know what people are defining as a fissure um focal lysis is what concerns me with surrounding sclerosis and that is a relative rare relatively rare finding in our population of horses i can't speak for other people's population of horses but as i say i'm sure there are horses with those that don't go on to fracture as well all right um Please keep sending in your questions, but it's time to move on to the last section of the presentation on case examples. Okay, so now we're gonna present some more case examples. Um, so just to put you in the picture, we're a teaching hospital uh, and a referral center. We are not at the coalface of racing. Um, most of our horses have been seen by someone else when they come to us. We, but we do get a number of horses through because we have imaging, light scintigraphy, 
now the standing CT and we do have MRI, but we don't have standing MRI. Our MRI is high field, so we don't do many race horses with that. We tend to do more the pleasure type horses with MRI, our high field MRI system. So our first horse is an older thoroughbred, seven year old thoroughbred horse, an older horse that's had 25 starts, which is a, quite a lot of starts, but probably not for a, a horse of that age. Um, interestingly, it had scintigraphy four years ago um, for a quite a decent three out of five left hind limb lameness. It was negative to a low four point, but responded at that point to a tarsometatarsal block. A diagnosis of proximal suspensory desmitis was made based on having very hot proximal plantar third metatarsal bones. Um, now it's come in four years later, it's lame in the other leg, the right hind, and it swaps to a left hind with a low four point block. The horses had radiographic radiographs um, and no changes were observed on those. Here's the scintigraphy from four years previously, remembering it was lame in the left hind then and had uptake, which we've cut off on this image, um, but it's now lame and blocks to a low four point in this leg. And you could argue that there's some subtle uptake in the palmar aspect of its third metacarpal condyles there, but it's not very exciting. Right hind here again. Um, but now on the CT, we've got this area of lysis here in the, both the lateral and the medial condyles surrounded by sclerosis. Joint surface relatively intact. This is the, do the oblique dorsal plane I was talking about. And this is this view here that we take that um, gets us perpendicular to the palmar area where a lot of the action is going on. And you can see we've got biaxial subchondral bone resorption with surrounding sclerosis. We don't have the sclerosis extending into the um, parasagittal groove area in this horse. Uh, so we have biaxial um, palmar osteochondral disease and we don't yet have the articular surface collapse in this horse. Just to show you what we're seeing, this is a micro CT of a similar type of lesion from post-mortem. This horse does have collapse of the articular surface. You can see the micro damage here, um, which may or may not be visible on CT. This is a reasonably large crack. Um, but notice the resorption that we're getting. So that's what we're seeing. This resorption here is the underlying resorption. And we generally see this underlying, um, these areas of micro damage in a focal lesion like that. It's relatively focal the uh, um, resorption. And you can sort of appreciate that there's slightly less density in the bone there as well. Um, but then we also see these more widespread lesions so this one is a more severe in that it's got a crack that's running across, but you might have just generalized micro damage running across. And in those cases, the lysis is more spread out and so less concentrated than it is um, in these more narrow lesions that we see. But again, you'll see this sort of on a CT, it might be as clear the lysis, but it will be there and it will be more generalized when you've got the micro damage extending further across the joint. So that's just typically what we see in a, PO, a palmar osteochondral disease case. And this case fits with what we know from the data out of Hong Kong, that it tends to be associated with more career starts and longer careers and more galloping um, and is less severe in our younger horses that have done less work. And there's the typical appearance at post-mortem of the collapsed um, articular surface and the sur surrounding articular dam um, the surrounding cartilage damage that we see with them. Um, they don't all fit the picture. So here we have a two year old thoroughbred that has, hasn't even raced yet. It's now in its second preparation. It's developed a left forelimb lameness when just up to trot and canter. So it's not even going very fast in this preparation. Um, and it's developed lameness. It initially, interestingly, initially blocked to a palmar digital block in the left fore, um, but it's subsequently improved with a lateral palmar metacarpal block, which makes us think that we've got condylar pain in that lateral condyle. Um, but only being a two-year-old horse doesn't really fit the picture of uh, what we typically see. But on CT, it has almost an identical type of injury to that last horse, a large area of lysis surrounded by sclerosis in the lateral condyle. And here again on our oblique dorsal view, we've got this large area of lysis here surrounded by sclerosis, now extending into the parasagittal groove. And there is a little bit of lysis there, but it was only on this one slice. So I wasn't that concerned with that. 
um, here we've got, um, but we've got this quite extensive palmar osteochondral disease in a horse that's done very little. And remembering I said that there are multiple pathways to injury. And so, and there will be exceptions to how in injury occurs. It won't always, they don't always follow the rules, but this is one that's happened with very little work. So presumably its bone was not very well adapted to what it had to do and it failed very quickly as a young horse. And then not to leave our standard bred um, athletes out, we have a six year old standard bred racehorse um, that has quite a significant lameness. So I don't normally see them that severely lame with a palmar osteochondral disease uh, injury. Blocks to a low four point, interestingly has a history of previous hock injections and I don't know about other people, but in our hospital that is reasonably common for me to see horses with fetlock problem, the, where we identify a fetlock problem where prior pe people have been um, thinking it's in the hock. For some reason, people love to blame the hock in a hind leg. If you don't do your blocks, you're gonna get it wrong. Um, and I think fetlock pain in hind legs because it doesn't show up very well on x-rays, um, particularly these POD lesions is often underestimated. And so it's really important to do your blocks. Um, so when this horse has been blocked to the fetlock, we've then done the CT on it. Um, and here again on our oblique dorsal view, you can see you've got this quite significant semicircular lesion running up deep into the subchondral bone, very wide area of lysis. Um, and then we see it here on the, sorry, extending quite a long way through the bone. Um, can see there and then on our sagittal view the same thing extending right up through the bone. So that's a relatively significant injury and probably why this horse has um, got a reasonable amount of lameness. Um, I'm, I was particularly interested in how large this area of lysis was and I wondered whether they've backed off this horse a little bit and allowed that the osteoclast activity to occur in there. Um, if we look at a electron microscopy image of another horse with a similar type of injury. So here we've got a large extensive area of micro damage. You see the crisscrossing cracks here. This horse has now been spelled for about um, eight weeks. And you can see the massive resorptive response that's happening along the margins of this area, but it's the, uh, the osteoclasts are unable to penetrate into this, air, into this area, probably because of the micro damage is so severe that it's lost its blood supply. And there's too much micro motion for the um, osteoclast to be able to get into that area. And so we end up with this very wide rim, semicircular rim of lysis, which is probably what we're seeing in this horse here. And because it's been reasonably lame, they might have backed off it for a while and allowed those osteoclasts to really get working in there, but they're unable to penetrate the um, bone here, this very white bone, which is probably like that because it hasn't remodeled for some time. This is the other leg, um, the contralateral limb, the left hind, and you can see it's got a much milder um, area of lysis in that, but it's got an area of sclerosis in its lateral condyle. And interestingly, it also had a sesamoid lesion, um, focal area of resorption here in the subchondral bone, quite large area of resorption, not in the typical place that we see normally, which sits sort of down here. We've got this large area of lysis um, and in standard breads, probably not at such high risk of fracture, but certainly of concern that there's, when there's lysis to that degree going on, that you've got a reasonable amount of micro damage associated with that. Moving on to our next case, we've got a five-year-old stallion, thoroughbred stallion. Um, the vet had obviously been concerned about the horse's fetlock because it's been x-rayed and seen this vague sort of subtle lucency in the uh, lateral parasagittal groove. Um, took a, the vet had taken a number of x-rays. It was a, visible on some x-rays and not on others. Um, and because this horse was a, a, a quality horse and they wanted to see whether they could keep racing it, it was sent into us for a CT. This is the CT I've showed you before. Um, showing the sclerosis and the focal lysis within that area. Yes, it does have a little fissure as well at the surface, but I'm more concerned about the lysis and the way this um, sclerosis is leaning across into the um, parasagittal groove area, um, suggesting that that area is under strain. Um, so 
that, that this was of concern to us and obviously we um, recommended that they back off this horse. Just showing you how the typical um, orientation of the sclerosis with a POD lesion tends to be focus over the condyle, condyle like this, whereas this is the more typical distribution of the um, sclerosis we see associated with these areas of lysis and growing condylar fractures in the condylar parasagittal groove. So our next horse is a six-year-old thoroughbred, which is a well-performed over middle to long distances. Um, but in its last 12 months has performed relatively poorly and it now has this typical quadrilateral lameness that we see in these older distance horses uh, that tend to have a lot of pathology associated with their fetlocks. And the beauty of the scanning is that we can quickly do all four fetlocks um, and knees in this case because the, we were concerned about this horse's action. Um, this is its right fore and it's got one of these POD lesions with the collapsed articular surface. It's also got a calcification and its distal sesamoidian ligaments and an area of lysis in the um, base of the um, medial sesamoid. Uh, this is the oblique view. It's got a little bit of a um, lysis sitting in that parasagittal groove, uh, a little bit in the other, some sclerosis surrounding that, but I'm probably more concerned about the POD lesion in this one. Again, indentation. Notice how there's not a lot of um, resorption in this one, there's a little bit, and that's not atypical for these more chronic, longer term ones like this one. Here's the little defect in the um, medial sesamoid that we can see here. We go on to its other fetlock. It's got a um, area of lysis in this one, again, surrounded by sclerosis in the lateral parasagittal groove. It's also got collapse of the bone. Uh, on the medial condyle here, associated again with a POD, sclerosis, uh, some vague lysis sitting within that. We go up to its carpus and it's got a subchondral, small subchondral cystic lesion, it's radial carpal bone extending very deep into the subchondral bone, surrounded by sclerosis. Here it is here on the dorsal view. Um, and in its other knee, it's got sclerosis and a similar cystic type lesion in its third carpal bone indentation of the surface you can see here. So this horse has multiple lesions. Uh, it's an older horse and this is typical of these older horses and CT is a very quick way of assessing all those joints quickly and getting a real handle on what we've got to deal with in that horse. And I'll stop there for a few more questions before we go through our final cases. Okay, excellent. Um, we're just a little bit behind on time, but I think we have time for one question here. So Chris, uh, I'm merging several questions together yep. to um, ask, uh, several participants are asking, um, uh, can you comment on the sensitivity of CT versus MRI for detecting these lesions like POD? And also, you know, with the idea that MR can potentially obviously detect bone edema, et cetera. Yeah, so um, the, the th MR, sh MR and CT show you different things. CT is very good for the structure and has higher resolution, particularly than the standing MR, which has relatively low resolution. Um, but MR sh does show you the fluid signals. And the question is, what are the fluid signals? And the answer to that is we don't really know. And when do they occur? Um, again, we suspect they occur relatively late in the piece uh, if they're associated with a with with fracture, um, and they they there is the potential that they can show you that something is 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 progressing more than something else. Um, <sighs> The problem is we just don't have enough evidence to know that. I know people that are very skilled at it can do a great job, and um, when they're at, in, in, in working closely with the horses with MR, they can do a great job at monitoring lesions and seeing how they're changing over time. Um, we're not in that situation where we can monitor lesions over time that closely because we are we aren't at the cold face of, of the of the racetrack, and. CT for me provides me with much more detail and we can image a lot more areas a lot more faster. Um, but you're right, we don't, because it's purely structural, you don't know whether something is getting bigger or getting smaller. Uh, you don't know where at the, cy the, cycle, the, uh, the cycle of healing or progression of a, of a, of a problem you are. Um, and that's something that we need to do more of and do more serial CT to understand. But my, 
the thing I like about the CT is that we can do more horses more quickly uh, than we than you can with MR, and we have higher resolution. But the downside is we're not able to see um, bone activity uh, like you might be able to with PET. Um, and the other beauty of the CT is the image quality is not so operator dependent as the MR. I've seen a lot of MRs um, that are highly, the, that, you know, from places that do a really nice job and get beautiful images and then other places that struggle to get good images. Um, whereas the CT is not so operator dependent, it's much easier to get high quality images. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's swings and roundabouts. They're telling you different things. In an ideal world, we'd have both. All right, I, uh, please keep sending in your questions and we'll move on to the last section of cases. Thank you, Dave, uh, Chris. Okay, so uh, our final few cases, here we have a three-year-old thoroughbred that's raced 10 days previously. Uh, six start this preparation, which is quite a lot of starts for a horse in our area um, in a preparation. It's pulled up lame after galloping and been referred in for a lateral condylar fracture. So we don't really need CT to diagnose the fracture. We know it's got a fracture. Um, but for us, because we now have the standing CT, it allows us to do pre-surgical management. And being a surgeon, you love 3D information um, before you're doing surgery. So we've done the surgery here in the CT room. We've put staples, as you can see, on the leg to try and identify um, where they are in relation to the fracture. You can see the fracture line here. You can see the sclerosis around it. This is the oblique view, just trying to see if there's a little fragment in there. And there might be a small one, but we weren't too alarmed by that. Um, so having, here we have the horse in the CT room. We've scanned the leg with the staples in, and then we've used those staples to align the aiming device, which we've put on the leg. And here Liz is um, drilling the first hole. Um, we're able to put the screws in. We're able to immediately rescan the horse with the screws in. You can see now the fracture line is gone. Uh, so we're happy with that. We can see the alignment of the screws. And one of the beauties of the standing CT is because its um, beam angle is transverse to the limb, we're not getting a lot of artifact. We get a little bit associated with the screws because the screws are in the same plane as the scan. Um, but we can see a reasonable amount of detail and that's gonna um, give us good information about where our screws are and how we've positioned them. So just to show, the, show you that with standing CT, it, it enhances standing surgery. Um, and it can be done, all done in the one room uh, with relatively ease. And because it's quick and simple, um, it fits into the surgery process quite well. Our next horse is a six-year-old thoroughbred gelding that's had 16 starts. Again, at seventh race, this preparation, which is, again, is a quite a lot for a horse in our area. Um, it's, left, it's got a left four condylar fracture post-race, even though it finished the race and came fifth. Um, and it's been sent in for us into us for assessment. Here are the x-rays. And the concern is that, that it's a medial condylar fracture and it's spiraling as we can see here. Um, we're not, looks like there might be something going on at the articular surface. So again, CT is great. Looking at three, things in 3D to understand the configuration of a fracture. And you can see the fracture lines relatively well in 3D here and how it's spiraling. Um, we do have a small fragment here, which is going to affect, uh, we're going to need to get out of there to get that to come together nicely. But what concerns us more is how this then comminutes in the mid shaft. And so this is not going to be able to be repaired standing with just running some screws up. Even if we can get them beautifully positioned, it's going to need a plate. And because this is a, an older gelding, um, the owners then decided once we talked about plating and the cost and the chances of it coming back and racing again, um, they decided that they weren't going to go ahead with that. So that horse was euthanized. But the CT enabled us to give an accurate understanding of what was going on, all done in the standing horse. So no risk to the horse in doing it. Um, and we we're able to give the owner a prognosis. The next one's a five-year-old thoroughbred that again has had quite a few starts and it's the second start of this preparation. Um, it's got a two out of five, left full limb lameness, following fast work, some pain on knee flexions, Radiographs showed some C3 lysis, um, which I'll show you in a sec. Here's the oblique views, and there's a little bit of modeling on the dorsal aspect of the radial carpal bone, but not much else to see there. A number of skylines were taken because there were these suspicious areas of lysis, um, small areas of lysis in the, both the radial facet and the intermediate facet of the third carpal bone. Um, 
And so we've CT'd it. And here in the left fore, we can see we've got a lot of sclerosis in the radial facet. And then near the articular surface of the mid carpal joint, we've got these areas which we can very easily delineate on CT of focal resorption. But we couldn't see these other ones over here on the intermediate facet until we went down into the carpometacarpal joint distally on the third carpal bone. And here you can see sclerosis, focal lysis here uh, in the subchondral bone as we get very close to the um, carpometacarpal joint. So from the um, x-rays, we're a bit suspicious that something's going on there, but we don't know where it is. And with C2, we can um, be much better at working out exactly where it is. Here's the... Uh, Sagittal view showing some radiocarpal lysis and the areas in the third carpal bone that are lytic. Um, same here on the medial aspect, multiple areas of lysis surrounding by sclerosis. And here's our area in the carpometacarpal joint over here, um, which if you'd done arthroscopy, you would have been looking for that and poking around trying to find it up here, but it's actually sitting down here. Uh, so we know that from the CT. Um, Here's the area here again, x-ray, I struggle to actually see it on an x-ray and try and identify it um, because of the complexity of the joint. And that's the beauty of CT in these complex joints that are hard to assess radiographically. Um, we're able to see a lot more interestingly in its contralateral limb, it's got a subchondral cystic lesion in its um, radial carpal bone as well, which we couldn't see on x-ray. And then our last case, a two-year-old thoroughbred filly um, it's unraced, but has been in work one month. So again, a horse that's not done very much. It's now gone three out of five lame after its first fast work. So people are a bit concerned that it might have a stress fracture of some sort. Um, clinically, all it had was a little bit of swelling in the left mid carpal joint. And the referring vets have done an abaxial, a low full point and a subcarpal block and haven't blocked the lameness. So notice that the blocking pattern, they've got up to a subcarpal block and it's still lame. Um, so they're wondering, you know, where, where this is. They've sent it in for a scintigraphy for that purpose because they're not sure where the lameness is. And interestingly, we end up with this focal hotspot on the dorsal aspect of the distal um, third metacarpal bones biaxially, but worse in the right four. Um, and notice that that hasn't blocked to a low four point and a subcarpal block, probably because it's more dorsal. Um, now, we don't really need CT to diagnose this, but we do, um, it does show you the uh, new bone production on the front of the left four. We couldn't see any def real defect in the um, cortex of the bone on that one, but in this one, you've got this defect in the cortex, this lysis extending in, much more extensive new bone production. And the reason I show these is not because we need CT to see it. Um, we could diagnose this with an X-ray, but just to show you that this is an area where we do see catastrophic fractures coming from, and we're going to pick them up in our usual screening with a CT of the lower limb. Um, uh, but you know, it also shows us nice detail on the fracture. Here they are in transverse. The left not so bad. The right's got this lysis running into the um, cortex and the overlying. Um, new bone production. And then we see it again on the dorsal view, the fracture running across the front of the right four. Um, and as I say, those are potentially catastrophic, not always we, if we pick them up early. And of course, they sh this new bone shows up nicely on the 3D imaging. But just to show that if we're screening horses fetlocks, we're going to pick those sort of, that's another fracture, that, another area to look where we might see a catastrophic fracture developing, although far less common than our condylar fractures. So in summary, um, standing CT provides rapid 3D imaging of all four limbs. It can identify lesions that are challenging to in, uh, image with other modalities. It provides more complete assessment of an area. So you might see the uh, actual lesion with x-rays, um, but this allows you more complete assessment, particularly of the subchondral bone areas, those dense subchondral bone areas that are difficult to image with x-rays. Currently, we're not doing wide-scale screening, but we are, we're only imaging cases that um, regulatory vets have clinical concerns for um, the big races that are happening in Melbourne. And we do know from our post-mortem studies that we're able to detect changes in the fetlock that carry significant and substantial um, risk, um, but we need to do a lot more work to understand what that risk is um, 
and uh, be able to make better calls going forward. I need to thank my research team and my and collaborators and the funding bodies that fund me um, and say thank you for listening. Any further questions? All right, um, we're a little bit behind, but I think we can just answer um, a couple of, merge a couple of questions in um, and answer them pretty quickly. Um, so Chris, could you comment on, um, for your fracture case, um, uh, do you have to block the leg to order to get the horse to stand for the uh, imaging? Um, well, we already, in that case, we already had because we wanted to put staples into it. Um, you can scan, you can scan the horses without it blocked um, and you can scan um, with a Robert Jones bandage on them and sedated, but yes, they're more, they're going to be, there's, there's the risk of more movement and certainly the ones we've scanned with fractures have had a little bit more movement in them, but it's been enough to see what we want to see. And could you come on and yet, have you yet um, had any experiences with follow-up imaging with standing CT to sort of monitor healing or how these lesions change over time? We haven't had the system long enough and we've been a little bit stymied by the coronavirus crisis lately that we're not scanning as many horses as, as we would like, although we still are scanning horses. Um, so yeah, we, we need to have a lot more experience and, and in, yes, in an ideal world, we'll be doing a lot more of the serial scanning. That's why we got it because as I say, most of our data is cross-sectional uh, because it's post-mortem data. And one of the things we wanted to do was get more longitudinal data. And that's something we want to do more of going forward. In, um, can you comment on uh, or any sense yet of the proportion of horses with parasagittal groove lysis in the distal end of the cannon bone that um, uh, you can detect with CT that are not um, ed evident on a DP radiograph? In other words, like how, how many, if you do screening radiography, how many horses are being missed, do you think? Uh, we don't have hard data on that because, as I said, we haven't had the opportunity to do those sorts of studies, but certainly most i think it's it's challenging to see those well on radiographs yes if you take really nice radiographs and you take multiple you can see it i think the case example i showed where that was a very very subtle change on radiographs and yet it was relatively clear on the ct i, I suppose shows you the limits of radiographs it's, that was probably on the margins of what you can see with radiographs um and yet is relatively easy to see with um, CT, but we haven't done large numbers to know what the numbers are. In the, um, maybe two more questions before we um, uh, wrap up. And one is, do you have, have you yet had any opportunity to gain experience with contrast imaging with your standing CT system? Uh, we've done a little bit of contrast imaging, not a lot. Um, they've probably done more um, as was described in the last webinar at um, Wisconsin. Um, we've done, a, we've probably done a couple, I think, where we've done intravenous um, contrast and uh, pr not enough to be able to comment on its usefulness, but I think that's something we'll be doing more of going forward. But clearly that's not something that you're gonna be able to do um, when you're trying to scan lots of racehorses. And uh, one final question. Um, uh, at the beginning of your lecture, Chris, you said sort of or commented that you kind of discouraged use of CT before radiography. Um, but you've also through the lecture commented um, as that many lesions can't be seen with CT. So can you can you um, expand on your comments about how you view the um, relationship between DR radiography and CT for um, screening or imaging of racehorses? Uh, I'm not discouraging its use prior to CT. I'm just, um, it's just that that's often, I, I don't and think, I don't way, think. Discourage the use of CT prior to radiography. Yeah, I'm not discouraging that. I just don't think we should be making de decisions based on convenience, which is what my staff are saying. Um, I think if, if you, if you have a clinical um, reason for doing it, that's fine. I don't have any problem with that whatsoever. Um, and, where it's simple and easy and the owners are prepared to pay, um, you know, I'm as frustrated as the next person that, that does lots of lameness with x-rays um, and, and what they do and don't show. So, you know, if CT is simple and easy, I think that's probably the um, preferable way and, and with, with some horses, but it needs to be based on clinical decision-making, not on convenience. All right. Um... 
uh, I think um, be, for the sake of time, we're a little bit over time, we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, we will um, try our best, um, the panelists collectively to answer um, and follow up with uh, the many questions that have been sent in for the ones that we haven't um, had time to address during the presentation. But I'd like to thank Professor Witten for a fantastic seminar and for the excellent question and answer session from all of you, the participants. Clearly there's much more scientific data needed on use of standing CT in the racehorse and much work to do as the field moves forward into the future. And finally, I just like to um, remind everybody to look out for the next um, ASTO CT uh, standing um, CT presentation that will focus on equine dental cases. And I know a couple of people sent in questions on head imaging. And I think if you're interested in the head and neck, um, please look out for the um, seminar um, that's scheduled for June 5th. And um, uh, I think the with that, we're ready to wrap up, David, unless you had any final comments. No, I just want to thank you, Chris, and thank you, Peter. It was a wonderful presentation, and thank all the uh, participants. You know, we'll see you at the next webinar.